Thank you for all. So, welcome everybody. My name is Sadeh Mishbeli, and uh, welcome today to this uh, to the first edition of um, of the Young Mediterranean Voices Regional Debates series. I hope, and um, I'm glad to see a lot of people who joined this uh, this online debate. So I'm um, I'm a former debater and uh, a member of uh, the Young Mediterranean Voices family. Um, I have been the uh, regional program manager for this program uh, a couple of years ago um, and a debate trainer. I'm glad to be moderator today and to join uh, this group of bright people from all over, from uh, all the uh, MENA region. Uh, so today we have, we will have uh, an online debate using the Oxford, Oxford uh, format. I will be uh, presenting and moderating this debate. Uh, before starting, I would like to thank all the people who, uh, who made this online debate um, uh, and prepared all the, this online debate uh, and made it uh, through. So uh, before kicking off the debate and explaining to our dear audience uh, how this debate will be running, what are the rules, uh, how we will proceed, uh, I would like to introduce uh, the, the team behind, uh, behind the organization of this debate. Uh, so we have, uh, we have Amini Hamouda, we have Erij uh, Soussi, we have Ines uh, Twal, we have Noor uh, Bo Abdallah, Tasneem Bin Twaiti. So it's like they will be managing the, uh, the reporting aspect of this debate. Uh, we have our timekeeper, uh, Marwa Sherni. We have uh, Riyam Mishrahi and Bassem Suisi uh, to collect your questions. So those will be the people who will be collecting the questions from the audience and <coughs> managing them. Uh, please, ah, by the way, please, can you all turn off your mics uh, so we, we can guarantee the best quality voice uh, for all the people who will be participating? So this is from the organization side. So now we will uh, have two, uh, we have four debaters, so two teams uh, of debaters, uh, a team that will be representing the government and a team that will be representing the opposition. Uh, regarding the government, we will have uh, a team uh, of Tunisia and Algeria, so represented by Adlen Anan and Aladdin Mbarki. So this will be the government team. And we will have a team for the opposition represented by Lebanon and Morocco, uh, through Marwa, uh, Marwa Abdel Faraj and Fatma Zahra uh, Utais. So this will be uh, the, the different teams that will be represented for this debate. And uh, before starting as well, I would like to explain how this debate will be, uh, will be made so far. So uh, before uh, giving the floor to our dear debaters, we will do an initial vote uh, that we will invite, for which we will invite, we will invite our audience to, uh, to select uh, the, uh, their opinion, to know their opinion, whether they are for or against the motion. We will pre present the motion, of course, uh, later on. Uh, we will have then some opening remarks uh, between, uh, for our debaters. Then we will have an intra-panel discussion uh, where we will be asking, I will be challenging the, uh, the debaters. Then we will have question and answers that will be selected among the questions that you will be asking. So the debaters will have to answer those questions. Uh, finally, we will have closing remarks for this debate, uh, which will be two minutes each for every one of them. And uh, we'll have a final vote. Uh, so we will vote again. And uh, we will select or we will assess the debaters on the quality of their arguments. So the audience, on the basis of the change uh, of perception from the audience, we will know which team was better in arguing and in debating. So this will be the process that we will be uh, going through during this debate. Uh, the approximative uh, length of this debate and uh, will be around 18 between 70 and 80 minutes so um, 
So like going through the opening remarks, going through the inter-panel discussion, the question and answers, uh, and of course the final vote. So this will be the, uh, the average length for this debate. And um, of course, uh, like I have been keeping the motion uh, until the end for this debate, which is like, I think uh, everybody has seen the motion for this debate so far. Uh, so our motion is, uh, is a bit uh, controversial and we were selecting this motion on purpose to, uh, to, challenge, uh, to challenge those young people from all over the region. So this, the motion is about this house uh, would, this house will dissolve the World Health Organization. So this will be the motion that the government team will be defending. Uh, coming, to, uh, coming to the motion, I wanted to set a bit the context for this motion. So as a lot of the people who are following now uh, the debate regarding uh, the spread of this of this virus, the COVID-19 virus, uh, and like for over 60 years, the World Health Organization has been the prominent international health organization. But today, as all of you know, there is a lot of questions about its response to this global infectious disease, uh, whether in the former time like AIDS, SARS, or Ebola, or today as we speak, uh, the COVID-19. So like the substantial criticism uh, over the World Health Organization crisis management efficiency is making the headlines. Uh, as we have seen, the main accusation is about the fact that this organization was either too lax or too compliant with China during the outbreak of the virus. And this pandemic could have been avoided if the World Health Organization did its job. Um, two weeks ago, or a bit more than two weeks ago, Donald Trump, uh, at the White House news conference said that the World Health Organization had failed in its basic duty and it must be held accountable. He said that the group had promoted China's disinfor disinformation about the virus that likely led to the wider outbreak of the virus than otherwise would have occurred. So taking into consideration all this, uh, all this like updates about all, all this news about the, the role of the World Health Organization, and that being said, if you acknowledge the existence of organizations like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, Doctors Without Borders, UNAIDS, UNICEF, Oxfam, uh, all those organizations are contributing and even sometimes leading the way uh, in medical research as well as monitoring and assessing health trends. Uh, so this brings me to the question of this debate. Is an organization like the World Health Organization still relevant today? So, ladies and gentlemen, this is the question uh, that will bring our government uh, team today, and this will, question will be uh, at the heart of the debate that we will have today. So, um, before starting, I want to, uh, to check if both teams are here and are ready. Can you hear me? Yes. So, yes. Prime Minister of the, and Deputy Prime Minister, Leader of the Opposition and Deputy Leader of the Opposition. Everybody's are here? Yes. 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 Perfect. So our, uh, our timekeeper, is our timekeeper ready to kick off the debate? Yes. Okay. So uh, we will start with the Leader of the Government or the Prime Minister. Uh, the floor is yours. Greetings to everyone attending this debate today, to all the moderators and audience. We are here today to take a look, a real look, into the World Health Organization and its impact on the world. The World Health Organization was established 70 years ago as an attempt to unify the healthcare system on an international level with the duties of providing leadership, guiding research, setting standards, providing support and monitoring health situations around the world. For the better part of its existence, the organization has utterly failed in performing these duties with very few successes. 
If we recall the world's largest health threats in the past century, the WHO has been inadequate in handling most, if not all of them. The 1980s HIV epidemic, the 2009 H1N1 pandemic that lasted 20 months, and the current COVID-19 that has already claimed more than a quarter million lives due to their slow response. These failures of the World Health Organization can be traced back to two main reasons, ineffectiveness and corruption. As an institution, the WHO is tangled in bureaucracy and politics. Many questions have been raised concerning the organization's transparency in management and finances. Who exactly is funding who? The organization's reliance on funding from various shady resources opens it to the influence of its donors, which can be seen in instances of their decision making. In 2006, a proposed AIDS treatment resolution was withdrawn from a WHO meeting because of US opposition, the United States at the time being one of its biggest donors. Not only this, but WHO has been caught endorsing some medications and drugs intentionally lending their voice and credibility to boost the sales of dangerous meds, only to benefit big, to benefit big pharma companies, like in the case of Purdue Pharma and their opioids. For a trusted public health organization to falsely advertise for meds that could be harmful and spread misinformation is a betrayal to the oath they undertook of do no harm and to the public's trust put in them. Corruption and schemes aside, is the WHO truly doing anything beneficial? The organization is famous for not following through with plans and initiatives that they set out to do and for taking credit for work that they did not do themselves. Most of the achievements, achievements that the WHO boasts are the result of others' work, NGOs and governments own healthcare systems. The successes and health strides of countries usually go unrecognized until the WHO certifies them, which could take years. And consequently, the organization takes credit for the work that they didn't do themselves. And this is evident even more so in third world countries. In Algeria, the Ministry of Health spent years fighting indigenous malaria through the efforts of its National Institute of Public Health and managed to eradicate it in 2013 with zero help from WHO, only for the latter to send the committee to Algeria in 2016 to collaborate on work that's already been done and eventually to declare the country malaria-free in 2018, five years after it's already been eradicated. I can go on and on and on about the failures and incompetences of the World Health Organization, but I'm afraid five minutes simply is not enough. Maybe perhaps if you have a free week. This isn't the first time WHO was put under scrutiny. Many before have called for investigations and reforms concerning the organization, but all of those brought no results whatsoever. This is why today we are here to call for dissolving the World Health Organization once and for all and replacing it with something better. Our proposed alternative is a coalition of countries' health ministries and departments. This coalition will maintain the essential duties of WHO while getting rid of the centralization, politics, and the problems arising from, uh, and the problems arising from WHO's funding model by giving more autonomy to individual countries. The coalition will be joined together by a treaty to share information and cooperate in research and development. A committee of representatives from each member state will be created to set world standards and guidelines, and the whole thing will be observed and enforced through peer review by independent committees from other countries to maintain transparency of the operation. This alternative coalition will be a better viable solution to the currently broken system by allowing governments to take charge of their own health care and develop a network of cooperation among countries of the world. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, Prime Minister. Uh, before moving uh, for, for the next speech, uh, there was a bit like some technical difficulties for, to display the poll. So I thought that like all the, um, all the audience were able to have access to the poll. So can we have the poll for uh, this debate displayed for all the audience uh, in order to have an idea about the opinion before the debate? And apologies again for these technical issues. Did everyone vote? Yes. Okay, perfect. 
So we can move now, we can continue. Uh, so we can, we will alternate now and hear the, uh, the leader of the opposition. Um, and before starting with the leader of the opposition, I would like to remind you that you can ask questions at any time. So we have displayed the message in the chat box. And uh, again, uh, if you have any question at any moment, you can write it in the chat box. Thank you. The floor is yours. Hello, thanks to the moderator, to our colleagues and the government team and to the audience. We are here as an opposition team to against the House belief in dissolving the World Health Organization and our target is to reach better health by improving the WHO instead of dissolving it. Ladies and gentlemen, the rules of Oxford debate is very clear. Those guys have the burden of proof. If they haven't convinced you yet, I can literally say not say nothing and another world and would have won this debate. Trust me, I'm attempted because what you heard from our dear opponent team was nothing short but bladder. And let me explain why. Dissolving World Health Organization means dissolving the selfishly defend of everyone's rights the sustainable approaches of health and the strive to make people feel safe, respected, empowered, fairly treated and duly recognized. As the leader of opposition, we'll uh, talk about the medical argument. More than 7,000 people from more than 150 countries working in 150 country offices in six regional offices and headquarters in Geneva working to achieve highest possible level of health for all people all over the world and not only in the communicable and non-communicable diseases but also in the environmental health, life support, life support, trauma care and emergency work. Although, uh, and here are the, the reasons and WHO have done and still doing. Yellow fever vaccination, in response to the ongoing yellow fever outbreak in Brazil, 3.5 million doses of vaccine from the emergency was deployed to uh, was deployed sorry to the country through the international coordinated provision of for yellow fever. Two in Yemen crisis, nearly five million children under the age of five have been vaccinated in a nationwide covering all governments in Yemen. Children between the age of six were immunized against measles and children under the age of five were vaccinated against polio. Nigeria crisis, simultaneous vaccination campaign have been completed in Nigeria, Niger, Cameroon and Benin in an effort to polio transmission and ensure non-resurgence the viral and polio uh, free countries. Iraq crisis, WHO with logistic supports from the World Food Program airlifted 15 fully equipped ambulance in Iraq to, in order to better respond to the increased trauma and medical related emergencies in West, in West Mosul. Syria crisis, WHO expands mental health care services across the Syrian Arab Republic. More than half of all Syrians are estimated to be the need, uh, in need for mental health and psychological support services. One in four children are at risk of developing mental health disorder. Global health security, since February 26, 2016, 34 joint external evaluations have been undertaken across all six WHO regions, including Armenia, Bahrain, Bangladesh, Cambodia, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Jordan, Lebanon, Morocco, Pakistan, uh, Qatar, uh, United Republic of Tanzania, and United States of America. Reaching 2020, when COVID-19 was initially identified and reported by China in 31 December 2019, after less than one day only, it means in 1 January 20, WHO had quickly responded by setting up the IMST, which is the Incident Management Support Team, across the three levels of organization, headquarters, regional headquarters, uh, and country level, putting the organization on the emergency footing for dealing with this outbreak. WHO keep on following up on daily basis to come up with all the needed steps in order to co stop COVID-19, and it launched with the Partners uh, Solidarity Trial, which is an international clinical trial that aims to regenerate and robust data from around the world to find the most effective treatments for COVID-19. Although they have limited resources and funds, WHO and partners ship uh, life-saving medical materials to all African nations. WHO is on the front layer, front line, sorry, in the Eastern Mediterranean region. 
from testing suspected uh, cases, training rapid response teams, providing protective gears for the health workers, to getting the message out via social media. Moreover, WHO donates testing kits to the many countries, in addition to the beds, medical supplies, and new laboratory peripherals. In addition to many educational programs, programs sorry, done by WHO in order to spread awareness on the prevention of COVID-19, and here we invite you all to download the application of WHO that can let you all uh, um, benefit from its program. With the support of WHO and other partners, Egypt has now the capacity to conduct more than 2,100 tests. Our dear audience, five minutes of speech won't be enough to mention all the achievements supported with statistics and facts done by WHO. But overall, and after what I mentioned, uh, and what my team mate will mention, we are strongly against dissolving WHO. Thank you. Thank you, dear. Thank you, the leader of the opposition. Um, so now we will move again to the uh, to the government team. The deputy uh, prime minister, uh, you have the floor. Thank you, dear moderator, and welcome again, everyone, to this debate. Ladies and gentlemen, when we first came into this world, our journey started by our parents teaching us the differences between right and wrong. And step by step later, we learned that anyone who gets involved in a person's death must and will be held accountable, whether it's in the court of law or in the court of a guard. We'll, uh, with this perspective, ladies and gentlemen, we reinforce the proposal of the government. The solving the WHO is the minor form of justice that we should all of us advocate for. And let me demonstrate why through going back in time for a few weeks because the opposi opposition said the WHO have succeeded facing COVID-19, which is not true at all. February the 5th, 2020, WHO's general director keeps praising China for their efforts, claiming that they are preventing the virus from being exported to other countries and insisting on the fact that coronavirus is not an international concern yet, even though 12 countries were already compromised by the virus at that time. March the, uh, the 2nd, 2020, the virus kept spreading across Europe and it reached America. And the response of WHO was that there are no needs or there are no reasons to put measures that interfere with international trade and travel. Back then, only one country ignored this advice, which is Taiwan, who has one of the lowest rates of coronavirus infection in the world. In fact, Taiwan also warned the WHO that the virus might be uh, spreading through human to human transmission. But these warnings were ignored because apparently WHO is refusing to acknowledge its independence as China does. A few days later in March, Taiwan was distributing face masks to its citizens. The WHO is advising the rest of the world that they were unnecessary for non-infected individuals and unfortunately the world followed this advice. Later, health experts proved that masks can help to stop the spread, especially among asymptomatic carriers which is uh, a population that the WHO maintains as virtually non-existent while they do exist. On March 11, 2020, uh, WHO finally acknowledged the true uh, global crisis by declaring it a global pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, they waited until numbers reached 109,000 total COVID-19 confirmed cases and 3,810 related deaths all over the world which is a global tragedy. They have been busy with covering, uh, with covering up slash praising China and minimizing the global effects of the disease. They have been busy not listening to the warnings and giving all the wrong advices. Now we know that uh, WHO was being used for political issues. We know that the WHO could have saved a lot of lives if they, if they stayed neutral. We know for sure that if they acted differently, especially in the critical early weeks, the world wouldn't be suffering as it is suffering today. We are talking about nearly 4 million confirmed coronavirus cases and 275,000 deaths so far. If the WHO acted differently, the quarantine uh, period would have been shorter and therefore the world trade and global economy would have been less affected by this pandemic. Now, the bigger problem is that this happened before, during recent events, or let me call it failures. 
such as the 2009 H1N1 influenza pandemic and the 2014 Ebola uh, outbreak. In fact, this debate also happened uh, before, and there was extensive calls for the organization's reform and even establishments of an entirely new global health institution. Due to the series of mistakes and mishandling committed by the WHO during these two events, and eventually new reforms have been implemented in 2017. Ladies and gentlemen, as you can see today, we are in a loop. This is the third failure of the WHO in only 11 years. And the current pandemic should, be, should teach us the fact that we tried to reform and correct the WHO before, and it didn't work. This is why, ladies and gentlemen, we as the government, we consider WHO's actions as actions of incompetency and corruption that directly affects many people around the world. And we propose today to dissolve this entity and investigate deeply in this failing system with the implementation of a better one. Because once a failing system and corrupt system is always a failing and corrupt system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Deputy, <coughs> Deputy Prime Minister. So now we move to uh, the last, uh, the last debater from the first round. So uh, the floor is yours, the Deputy Leader of uh, the Opposition. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, when your arm hurts, you find ways to heal it, not amputate it. My Leader of Opposition and I are here today to stand against the dissolution of the World Health Organization. Throughout the years and virus outbreaks, the WHO displayed great resilience and responded efficiently and effectively as far as its resources allowed it to. Resources have been one of the main issues WHO had to adapt to in order to serve its ultimate purpose, which is to manage public global health. WHO adopted a proactive approach to the COVID-19 outbreak. It had been sharing information constantly. It had mobilized scientists, coordinated data research. It has collected evidence and tried to put forward clear guidance about what should be done. Now, the question here, obviously, is whether the organization is given enough resources to do its mission. Member states seem to be the very first ones to oppose effectively funding the WHO. And the US, as you all know, decided to cut funding by 53% right in the middle of the outbreak. Decisions like these render WHO in a conflict between its broad mission to serve the world's public health needs and the political realities attached to how the organization is funded. And not only it is very low on member state contributions, but the WHO has control only over 20% of its resources, given that the other 80% comes from um, what we call voluntary specified donations. This inflexibility, if I might, constitutes one of the organization's major structural issues that need to be addressed in order to give it more discretion over the allocation of its budget. Now, how the WHO manages virus crisis is also compromised by the bureaucratic um, red tape applied by its powerful donors. It is an organization with 194 masters, and those masters don't necessarily have the same agenda. And you can only imagine what a dilemma it will be for the WHO to try and balance all of the competing interests. So therefore, the WHO operates within a nest of bureaucracy, competing interests, and an overlarge mandate to rid the world of disease. On one hand, it is expected to be um, a world-class public health agency, but at the same time, it is expected to manage the complicated global um, the politics that emerge on health issues. Nevertheless, the organization is still managing to do a decent job, as it had displayed in 2003 SARS outbreak, 2014's Ebola outbreak, and now 2019's Corona outbreak. I mean, shortcomings have indeed been noticed, but is the WHO really guilty? The best defense this world has against future catastrophes is a well-funded and well-run World Health Organization. And unfortunately, the member states have deprived the WHO of its right to be both well-funded and well-run. The question of how to deal with China at the COVID-19 outbreak is a prime example of WHO's large dilemma 
of um, reconciling the gap between the individual interests of 194 nations and the world's public health needs, human rights standards, and everything else that the WHO is mandated to uphold. I mean, being caught in such conflicts, the organization's ability to carry out its mission will always be dependent on how long of a leash its member states allow it to in terms of the funding, the freedom to use that funding, and the freedom to make decisions regardless of um, the agendas of its donors. Now, dissolving the WHO would be throwing lessons learned from 1948 up until today down the drain. It took 70 years of scrutiny to realize that the WHO's low budget and relatively toothless structure need fixing. And COVID-19 won't be the last pandemic that befalls our world. And so we need to keep the WHO and we need to empower it to make diplomatically challenging decisions. We need to allow it to have flexible budget management and we need to provide it with a certain level of authority over its state members. For all that's been stated and more, I urge you, ladies and gentlemen, to oppose the dissolution of WHO. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Deputy Leader of the, <coughs> the government. So here we move to the uh, we move to the questions. So we will have an interpanel discussion right now. Um, I would like to remind our dear audience that they can still ask questions through the chat box and then we can vehicle those questions to, the, to our audience. Uh, so now I will be uh, challenging both, both teams on this motion. Uh, I, have, I will have two questions uh, for uh, the government and for the opposition. So from my side, so regarding the government, uh, I was listening to the alternative solution that you were proposing. Uh, the alternative solution of the coalition uh, of Ministry of Health uh, uh, senior respons uh, responsible or officials uh, seems to me a bit like the, uh, the, the, same, uh, the same framing of such coalition is so similar to the actual uh, bodies of the World Health Organization. But my question would not be on the construction or the building of such coalition. Uh, it will be on this alternative that you are proposing. Uh, you are talking of this alternative as the COVID-19 uh, pandemic is over. And then it's like right now uh, we can propose such solution. But what would happen uh, and who will be managing uh, the international coordination uh, if we have a second wave uh, of propagation of the virus? Uh, and this is uh, a probable scenario that uh, a lot of experts are claiming for the next, uh, for even for the next months. Uh, so uh, the, the time between setting up the new coalition and uh, developing and dismantling the World Health Organization, what would, how the international coordination will be made? So this is the first question uh, for the, uh, the government. The second question would be about, as well, it's a bit related to the first one, but what would happen for countries like uh, Palestine, like Afghanistan, like Jordan, where the World Health Organization is a key actor in supporting the provision of testing kits, trainings, and logistics, uh, especially if we, keep, if we uh, keep into consideration the fact that uh, the context is going to play against those countries economic context is going to play against those countries. So what would be your solution for those countries who are members of the United Nations and who are probably uh, some of the countries that would be concerned by the new coalition as well that you are proposing? Uh, now, uh, in regards to the opposition. So uh, for the opposition, the first question is, how would you deal with the lack of trust among citizens for the World Health Organization? Uh, during this, this crisis, and especially on the role of the World Health Organization as the leading global health organization uh, nowadays. So this lack of trust that citizens uh, have will, will impact uh, the, the World Health Organization. So how are you going to deal with this? And the second question is uh, a bit related to what you were, you were speaking about. So you were speaking about some technicalities when it comes to the, uh, 
to the lack of or capacity for the World Health Organization to fulfill its, its mission. But today, the reality is, uh, is, is that the World Health Organization lost its, its main and first donor, which is the United States. And uh, at, at the moment when the World Health Organization is asking for more than $1 billion uh, from, its, from different donors. So how would such organization, uh, if we look in numbers and resources, is incapacitated today to fulfill its role, how would you consider that such organization can further continue to serve the international community? Uh, so this, those were my two questions. And uh, is the timekeeper ready again? for displaying the yes. uh, okay perfect so so the floor so the the government so the floor is yours for uh, for answering the questions yes thank you Okay, well, uh, concerning first the questions that you mentioned about the alternative that we proposed, which is the coalition. Can there you repeat the uh, question? There are three uh, main things that I would like to address, three main points. First of all, you said if the coalition is framed the same way as who? which is not correct because the, the coalition would have much, much more flexibility since each country would be concerned for itself, mainly. It will not be centralized with one organization under one entity, but instead it would, be, it would work more like the space system where you have a system in every country and they all, all collaborate for, for research and information. And that would be it. For example, there would be no shared funding and there would be no shared political decisions. Each country would be responsible for itself. However, the treaty would work to share information and research, which are two of the key things that the WHO does. And of course, the committee would be, available, would be uh, responsible for uh, setting up the world guidelines, which would be, uh, which would be compromised from uh, leading scientists from each country that would be responsible for such a task. Uh, the other point is, you said, how is this coalition going to, to respond to COVID-19? Of course, this coalition is a proposed solution. We are not going to enact it right now. In fact, dissolving the WHO itself is a gigantic process that would take a lot of time. This coalition is not for an immediate response. Of course, there has to be some setups. We'd have to wait out this crisis. And then we are talking to future discussions. Since it is too late now to deal with COVID-19, we will just have to wait it out. Now, after this, after COVID-19 has passed and the world has come back to, an, to a normal state, we will have, to, of course, to consider different solutions than the World Health Organization. And the coalition is a proposed solution that we will have to look out into after the world has returned to a regular state. Your second question was, what would happen to countries like Palestine and Afghanistan after the WHO has been dissolved? The WHO may be helping them on a surface level, maybe perhaps some, through some donations and uh, some, some expertise. However, they do, pay, they do pay in funds to the WHO and they are not getting as much in return. This network, this network that is based on collaboration and help and this network that would put each country first, above anything else, would be much more helpful to them than the WHO currently is. Of course, the, most of the, the help that is going to Palestine and Afghanistan right now is not actually from the WHO, but it is from other NGOs, from uh, Doctors Without Borders and from other governmental, uh, non-governmental uh, institutions and charities. So the WHO technically is not doing as much as it should be doing in those impoverished countries. Now, I would like to revisit some of the points the opposition has raised. Uh, they mentioned that mainly the, the, the key issue is resources when it comes to who, that they don't have enough resources to deal with such problems. And that the, 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 gover the state members keep cutting off the budget repeatedly. Why are the state members cutting off the budget if the who was actually beneficial? Of course, the United States cut the budget because the who's advice during 2019 
2019-2020 epidemic was not, was not satisfactory. Their response was not satisfactory. So the United States thinks that the, their investment in the WHO is simply not being rewarded. And of course, that is the opinion of many other states, state members. This is why their, their resources has been dwindling since the, the time they've been created. They are not doing their duties. They had resources before and they did not perform as much as, as it was expected from them. In fact, they have cost, they have lost uh, governments more than they have been able to, to provide. When it came to H1N1 uh, in 2009, they overestimated the numbers of people that would need the vaccine. So member states had to order uh, more than was needed from uh, vaccine units. Most of them expired and went unused, costing member states and governments more than $2 billion in losses only to benefit big pharma companies that created the vaccine. So governments clearly see that they have outgrown the WHO and they, they, they no longer need to allocate any resources or funds for it because they are doing most of the job themselves uh, in, their, in each countries. And we see that, uh, especially in the countries that have responded to COVID-19 against the advices of the, the World Health Organization. And they, have, they are doing so much better than countries that have followed the advice of the World Health uh, organization. Uh, I hope this answers your questions and thank you. Thank you. Uh, so we move to, to the second team now. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, the very first question was regarding the lack of trust among citizens. Now, I have one word for you, propaganda. And I'm going to take the U.S. since it is the most predominant um, example in our situation. Um, how the U.S. is actually um, setting up propaganda um, about the WHO, and it's, I'm, I'm, I'm also going to refute some of the arguments that uh, my opponent used. Um, the U.S have done absolutely nothing to fight against the pandemic. I mean, have they followed the WHO's very clear advice on identifying cases, isolating cases, and conducting contact tracing? Uh, they wouldn't be in the appalling situation that they are in today. I mean, the USA vehemently criticized the WHO. They painstakingly pointed every one of its shortcomings, and it even decided to cut funding 53% under the excuses of seeking greater accountability and efficiency. How can you seek efficiency with scarce resources? And how can you demand efficiency while you haven't even followed the instructions given to you to mitigate the consequences of the pandemic? I mean, the USA did absolutely nothing to contribute to fighting against the pandemic, but run its mouth. And that actually mirrored into its citizens. And now they think that the WHO is not doing anything. And we are falling into the, the, the pit of, you know, um, the lack in trust. But um, I believe that the citizens need to know that the, the WHO is actually against um, a rock and a, and a hard surface. And the, the, the US is actually a very um, clear, um, clear example. Now, the second question of how can it continue to serve despite it being underfunded? That's what the WHO has been doing for the last, I don't know, 40 years, maybe. Um, I'm going to talk about the, 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 the funds cutting that happened to the WHO, and, and still, the WHO managed to work. I mean, I'll take the example of the Ebola. In the immediate 12-month period before the Ebola outbreak, the number of staff had been reduced from 90 to 36 people. And these staff in reductions were executed in response to um, a spending cut by member states um, in 2013, I guess, to the WHO's outbreak and crisis response budget. Now, faced with such reductions, it is likely that any organization will struggle. But the Ebola outbreak placed demands on the organizations that were far greater than ever experienced in almost 70 year history. And we're still the Ebola crisis occurred at a time when the WHO was responding to at least three other significant humanitarian uh, emergencies that were in um, Syria, South Sudan and Central African Republic. And so the, the collective decision by member states to reduce the WHO's crisis response budget was not only ill-timed, Ill but it directly compromised its ability to respond to the Ebola outbreak. Now. The question that um, my uh, opponent raised is why did the member states cut the funding? I'll tell you that 
if you know your history, in 2008, there was a financial crisis. It was a financial crisis that started to take its toll on the WHO's budget, and there was a big funding short, um, shortfall, and cuts were made to the, um, to the emergency uh, response programs, personnel cuts, and et cetera. So the funding gap stood at nearly 300 million in 2012. Now, speaking of uh, the WHO actually backing up uh, pharmaceuticals, I'll take the example that you used, Purdue Pharma. The WHO had never uh, had bad intentions in uh, backing up Purdue Pharma. Why? Because if you do your research, you would know that Purdue Pharma had never claimed its uh, opioids to be addictive. They've never said that the opioids uh, were addictive and history showed in the 2000s that uh, the opioids that were uh, commercialized by Purdue Pharma were actually um, um, the bad decision of pill mills, meaning doctors that actually used these opioids in a bad manner. And that what caused Purdue Pharma to be uh, to have so many legal suits now. And now that it has legal suits going on in the US, uh, WHO is not backing it up um, anymore. Um, and talking about how the WHO is not doing anything uh, in the countries that it's supposed to work in, let me tell you that the task of the WHO is to coordinate. And it's only um, assisting governments upon request. And governments have the first priority to take care of their people, not WHO. WHO must coordinate. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so as a reminder, uh, you, the, so the, the government team, you still have five minutes left and the opposition team, you still have six minutes left. So I will quickly come back to a uh, quick remark to challenge a bit what um, the government team w um, was, was speaking about. So you, you were telling that the coalition is not the same as the World Health Organization um, and it will allow more flexibility to, to countries. I think is the flexibility question is already existing. So the countries they are taking measures on the national level, uh, but the difference is on what the World Health Organization is doing in terms of coordination. So the coordination of info and especially the access to information that is made through the World Health Organization is making it going more smoothly. So I think this is a bit more my point when I was speaking about uh, the, the coalition and within the coalition, you are supposed as well to have certain means of communication between each country. Uh, the second point is like when you mentioned that it's not for now, so you don't want to dismantle the World Health Organization right now, but when and like, and how can you predict uh, the situation when you are talking about the pandemic of the coronavirus now? So it's like nobody can give an exact uh, timeline for this. So it's like, can you, can you give us more detail about the timeline for doing such, uh, such a proposal? And for doing this, you would need as well to gather some, some support, support from different countries. So it's like, how would you, you see this be made? So this is for the government and you still have, uh, you still have five minutes and 11 seconds. Okay, uh, thank you very much, dear moderator. Well, of course, we cannot dismantle the World Health Organization uh, now, or uh, at least, uh, I don't know, um, months from, from now, because uh, as we know, everyone, the uh, uh, coronavirus pandemic is uh, still occurring, and we might have a second wave of infections. Uh, of course, we cannot uh, make the same mistakes as the, as the WHO made before, and um, risk the lives of people as the WHO did before and uh, dismantle it now. Of course, we will wait, we will prepare uh, the, uh, the executive board that will handle the, the missions of the WHO until it, it is safe to dismantle it uh, around uh, the world and it is safe to pass on the missions of WHO to the new coalition. This is for uh, the second question. Uh, for the other question, uh, you said that we needed uh, approvals from a lot of countries. Of course we do, yeah. Uh, but uh, now a lot of uh, countries are demanding or are questioning the, uh, the missions or the advantages of having the WHO, which is um, 
uh, being uh, asked because of the uh, facts that we have uh, talked about previously and uh, the uh, being late in declaring it uh, the coronavirus pandemic, uh, covering up uh, China's action, etc., etc. These facts made uh, a lot of countries question the uh, utility of WHO, and a lot of questions already have uh, a lot of uh, questions are raised already. So I think we will not face a lot of problems concerning these points. Uh, I would like to uh, go and rebut some of some of the few uh, points managed managed to, to or told by the opposition. Uh, they kept uh, leading um, or talking about misleading information to the audience and um, uh, saying that uh, blaming the whole thing on the lack of resources, which is uh, very very misleading because uh, lately a lot of allegations were published about. Uh, 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 large sums of money, millions of dollars, being uh, vanish, va vanished from the internal uh, uh, of the WHO. Uh, the thing is, a lot of corruption, uh, are, there are a lot of corruption inside the WHO, and a lot of parts have been questioning about it. So the thing is, when WHO have corruption in it, and there are millions of dollars that are vanishing, and they come out later and say uh, they are uh, losing funding. Maybe that's why that explains the fact that WHO kept on delaying the announcement of coronavirus as a global pandemic. This can be a response. Also, the opposition kept saying that the, the, their only task is to coordinate. While on the other hand, they kept, uh, they kept saying that they are, uh, they are not funded well. Well, how many much? Uh, millions of dollars will you need to, 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 to coordinate, please. Also, the uh, opposition said that the WHO has responded efficiently and effectively, and they are doing a decent job. While we, while we said before that they failed in three global health uh, in three global health issues, that's not sufficient or that's not efficient for you to. Uh, to say that or to um, embrace the fact that they are uh, doing a lot of mistakes. The opposition said also uh, that there are 7,000 people around the world working with the WHO in order to achieve results. Uh, while they did not really uh, talk about uh, some decent results, the decent results that would um, uh, you have one minute make, left yes thank you that would make these um, uh, these uh, failures uh, at least uh, we can we can uh, not see these failures thank you very much thank you so we move to the uh, to the opposition for the last uh, reaction to the question and uh, rebuttal. Uh, so, so we still have six minutes left. Okay, thank you, our moderator. Uh, thanks again to the, all the audience. I have like some points to uh, shed a light on. The Prime Minister and the opponent team showed their alternative plan by creating coalition of ministries of health. They obviously forget, or, or at least didn't try to convince us uh, on uh, and their audience on uh, didn't set a clear plan. And this is show how the setting an alternative to a 70 years experience global health organization is impossible to happen by the policy that the PM and the opponent team has mentioned in their first speech. Let me remind you about something important and it's important fact about WHO. WHO has stakeholders that engaged with her, with it, sorry. And uh, and this is shows uh, that you didn't, uh, dear colleagues and the opponent team, you didn't do your research good. Uh, they work closely with the decision makers, uh, the ministers of health, governments and agencies, and this is at the national level. So uh, this shows also that the policy of our dear colleagues is, isn't valid and it's, uh, it's uh, contradictory and meaningless, uh, as if they want to change uh, for the sake of changing only. 
Uh, two, uh, the PM also uh, talked about the funds, but let me tell you about the funds, uh, something that you don't know uh, and that it is obvious that you don't know. WHO's budget is further complicated by its true sorry, avenue streams. Like any other UN organization, WHO assesses its members' dues. So the first revenue uh, stream, known as regularly, uh, regular sorry, budgetary funds that depends on the member dues. The organization has full control over what it is, what she wants to do, to uh, to do with these funds only. The second, every May, and sorry, every May, WHO convenes all of its member states in Geneva for the World Health Assembly, where the delegates decide how to allocate the regular budgetary funds. The second, or the other revenue stream known as extra budgetary funds, comes from the voluntary donation Give, given by the member states and private organizations for specific reasons or specific purposes. WHO therefore has no control over how it will spend that money. Their use is dedicated by the donor. In 2014-2015, when Ebola happened, funds make up 77% of whose budget or of WHO's budget. Donor interests do not necessarily align with WHO's priorities, hamstringing its ability to respond to crisis. WHO has direct control over so little of its budget. It simply can't shift money around of its Ebola response, for example. It has to beg for additional, for additional funds. This is concerning the funds. As for uh, as for also, uh, he talked that the PM also said about countries are doing it by themselves, as if uh, as if uh, the WHO is uh, doing nothing and the countries are doing all the achievement that we have uh, that we have uh, mentioned before in my first in my first speech. Uh, and this is totally wrong. It's not true because numbers and facts never lies, especially that many poor countries rely and currently depend on the WHO for medical supplies and health. And there are a lot of, of lot of uh, sorry uh, examples to give, and especially what happens in 2012 and 2016, uh, where uh, where 2016, for example. A rapid molecular diagnostic test for tuberculosis was evaluated and endorsed by the WHO, implemented in 77 countries. So, and there are a lot of also, and WHO represented also evidence to justify the need of urgent action to prevent the, the spread of untreatable gonorrhea, for example. Also, they addressed a lot of a uh, lot of um, a lot of diseases that happened in the poor countries, and they currently depend uh, mainly on the WHO, and uh, the countries cannot do it alone by itself. Uh, I, I want to go to talk about also uh, what happened in China, and uh, and uh, which means that, uh, for example, in, in 31 December 2019, China reported cluster of cases of pneumonia. In one January, it means after one day, a WHO had set up the IMST, which is the Incident Management Support. In 4 January 2020, after four days, WHO reported on social media that there was a cluster of pneumonia cases in Wuhan, which means they didn't take China report into granted. And and they didn't take the info uh, blindly. And to continue on answering the point that WHO was too reliant on the Chinese data, that we did too long to warn the world about the risks like widespread person-to-person -person transmission, as you, uh, as Dear Saddam uh, started his introduction and in, uh, uh, in introducing this debate, China gave the that the, there is an important point here to let you all know that WHO has no authority to go to the country without the permission of the government of that country. China gave the permission to the WHO on 20 and 21 January. January, uh, January 2020, to conduct a brief field visit to Wuhan. In 22 January, WHO mission to country, to China, issued a statement saying that there was evidence to human-to-human -human transmission in uh, Wuhan. Going back to a few days before, in 14 January specifically, which is before the field visit to Wuhan, WHO tweeted the following, preliminary investigation conducted by Chinese authorities have found no clear evidence on human-to-human uh, -human transmission to the novel coronavirus. That tweet, was posted 30 at seconds. Yeah, the same day that Maria and uh, she's uh, she's the lead technical lead of COVID of COVID nineteen uh, warned about the possible widespread. What I want to say in thirty seconds isn't enough at all. The blame uh, the blame the the blame is go 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 sorry to the system that lies with the international committee treatment of WHO and not WHO itself. Countries don't allow WHO and they get, didn't give WHO a political a backing when they are trying to stand up to human and speaking through uh, sorry a threat to power. Time's uh, up. 
Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you both teams for the enthusiasm and for the energy and for the arguments, of course. Um, now we are moving to, uh, to the audience and to the questions that we have collected from the audience. So, um, so the team, so we have 10 to 15 minutes for this uh, section of the debate and uh, we have collected uh, so far four questions, uh, two for the, uh, the government and two for the opposition. So regarding the questions for the government, uh, the first question is about um, China. So China tried to hide the virus. What guarantees that it won't do the same with the coalition that you are proposing? Uh, so this is the first question for the government. Um, the second question for the government is how your solution will unite all countries in the world taking into consideration that the tensions existing in terms of international affairs and to add more context to this question, uh, I guess a lot of you heard that yesterday the US rejected the resolution uh, in the Security Council that Tunisia and France were proposing in order to uh, halt and all, uh, all the armed conflict in the world uh, in order to face the COVID-19 uh, virus. So this is an example about uh, the, 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 the international relations context or the geopolitical context. Uh, the two questions for the, uh, the opposition now are about the World Health Organization is accused, uh, sorry, how can we free uh, the World Health Organization from political agenda. This is the first question. And the second question is, if the World Health Organization had a role to coordinate, so why don't we have a vaccine by now? Uh, so this is the, this, those are the two questions. And this time we will start by uh, the opposition team, and then we will move to the government team for answering. Um, so, and if we still have time, I will add more, I will add one question uh, for each team. So please start. The opposition team, the floor is yours. Sorry, I thought I was unmuted. Okay, um, the very first question is how can we um, free the WHO from the political agenda? Um, I would like, just to give you a little bit of context, I would like to take the example of China since it is the example that we are living right now. Um, you see in this context, politics are, um, whether we like it or not, steering the wheel. I mean, when you look at how the WHO actually backed up China by the beginning of the crisis, you would understand that politics dictates um, such diplomatic flattery. And it is the price uh, of ensuring Chinese cooperation with information and WH site visits. I mean, critics make it seem like the WHO's director general is a crony of China, but we should all understand that he's caught in the middle of a superpower struggle competition. And since China is um, extremely big on serving face, it's better to play politics to ensure cooperation than to play the blame game and risk um, closing the door to collaboration in the country where um, this all started. Um, if, if we keep pushing China, we might actually close the door to communication, just like pushing Germany for World War I only uh, created World War II. Now, you see, we are between, um, again, a rock and a hard surface. Do we um, comply with the political agendas just to make China um, give us all the data and information that we need in order to stop the pandemic? Or do we play the political game and we, we decide Actually, we play the non-political game and we decide that, no, we're not going to do politics and then we're going to risk um, the world health. I mean, it is it is a very compromising uh, situation. Now, how can we free the WHO from uh, political um, agendas is by giving WHO a certain authority 
over the member states. Um, since China wouldn't let the WHO, as my colleague said, into Wuhan only three weeks after, had the WHO had um, the authority to make China open its borders and let WHO get into Wuhan, we, wouldn't, we would have spared ourselves so many problems. And um, another thing, uh, WHO actually uh, requested the, um, the reports of the investigation on how the, um, the uh, virus started to China on so many uh, times, but China wouldn't cooperate. And so again, had the WHO had that certain authority over China, it wouldn't have to ask, it would it would have been able to go into Wuhan and actually carry its own um, investigation. Now for the second question, um, if the WHO is supposed to um, coordinate, why couldn't it find a virus, um, um, a vaccine already? I honestly cannot process this question uh, because I don't see any link between the WHO being uh, an entity that should coordinate on a, on a global level and the WHO finding the vaccine to, um, to the, the virus. It is, um, it is a collective uh, effort that all countries, all state members are working on, but it has absolutely nothing to do with the WHO being an entity that coordinates. Thank you. Thank you. So now we move to uh, the government team. Um, I guess you, you wrote down the questions, right? You don't need any clarification on the question that were asked by the audience. Please repeat the second question. Of course. So the second question by the audience um, is about the, how can we free the World Health Organization from political agendas? So this is, and like to give, to put it in context, I was speaking about uh, the geopolitical context or even the international relations context when it comes to tensions between countries or rivalities between the US and China. And concretely, I gave an example about the resolution, the UN Security Council resolution uh, that was dropped by the US and was proposed by Tunisia and France, um, which is showcasing a bit the, uh, the situation when it comes to, uh, um, to international relations. Uh, at a global level. So how would you free the World Health Organization from this political tension? This, this was one of the questions that was asked by, uh, by someone from the audience. So the floor is yours. Okay, thank you. So uh, as concerning to the, the first question, China tried to hide the to hide the, the, the numbers and the existence of the virus for, uh, from the World Health Organization. What makes us sure that it wouldn't do the same with the coalition? I would like to begin that China did not hide the existence of the virus. It only manipulated the numbers and it manipulated the facts, which under the coalition would not matter because each country would be responsible for their own health care. So all China has to do is declare that there is a virus and that they are dealing with it. However, they, can, uh, they, they would be responsible for, for their own numbers. How are they dealing with it? Is, it, uh, is, their, uh, is their method of handling the disease effective or not, that would be their responsibility. Each country would be responsible for itself. The only commitment the countries have to each other is sharing information. That is it. Of course, you mentioned that uh, the this also goes back to, to how the, the WHO has no authority whatsoever in, in, um, in working inside countries without the government's uh, approval. They have no authority over their funding and they have no authority over how they work. How is the WHO going to be effective in these circumstances if they have no authority whatsoever adding to their corruption? The second question relates to the first one. How can we, how can we, uh, fix the problem of politics and political agenda in the WHO? The simple answer is we cannot fix it. As long as uh, the, it has 140 plus member states with, the, with multiple stakeholders and multiple member funding them, we cannot fix the problem of political agenda, especially in a centralized entity. One ship cannot have 150 captains. Of course, there's always going to be political agenda and there's always going to be a political problem in the WHO. This is why we are proposing dissolving it to solve these two key issues, the issue of bureaucracy and politics and the issue of funding and corruption. 
These are the main two issues hindering the functions of WHO. And these are the main two issues that would not exist under the coalition, since there will be no political problems, since each, pro uh, each country will have its own autonomy in dealing with its health problems, and there would be no problems of funding, since each country will only be responsible for funding its own health ministry. The only thing here we will have is a, is a gentleman's agreement that, is co that comes in the form of a treaty to share information and help in research and development. The best example of a, of a system like this working is, like I mentioned before, the space program. You have NASA, you have the, the Chinese uh, space program, you have the Russian space program, the Israeli space program, the Indian space program. They are all separate entities belonging to their own uh, governments. However, they share one goal when they only share one thing, which is research and development. Uh, these are the two answers we have for now. Thank you. Thank you. So... We still have we still have eight minutes eight minutes and a half for for the questions and I still have some more questions. So for the opposition, what are the measures you suggest to improve the World Health Organization? So this is the question for the opposition. For the government, so the um, so the coalition is also going to be an entity. What guarantees the guarantees? Do we have that it won't do the same mistakes that World Health Organization is doing right now? And in your uh, comparison to uh, this, the, the International Space uh, Organization, so it's like, at, so here we are talking about uh, cooperation, not only in terms of research, and in, not only in terms of access to information, uh, but as well uh, in coordination, coordination. and knowing, in, knowing that we, we have a globalization context uh, where uh, transportations are making are becoming really are becoming really like a mean of uh, of accessibility, quite fast accessibility between countries. So you need some strong coordination between countries. And uh, how would you intend to do that? So this is like this is in relation to the uh, to the question that was asked before. So is it clear for both teams? I'm sorry, it's not clear for me the question of the, of the, to the government because they had a connection problem. So the question for the government is about the coalition. So it's like, how, what kind of guarantees do you have that the coalition will not do the same mistakes that the World Health Organization is doing right now? So it's like, what are the guarantees that you have that such model will not be falling in, in the same uh, meanderings of bureaucracies? Is it clear? Yes. So we started, we started with the, uh, the opposition, so we will start with the government this time. The floor is yours. Who will be speaking? Okay. Then? Yes, I, I am. OK, thank you very much. Uh, what guarantees do we have in order to prevent what happened before? Uh, as we suggested uh, in our uh, uh, policy or plan, we said that there will be uh, independent observers that will be observing uh, the work of the coalition 24-7 in all countries, meaning that these observers will not be uh, known to uh, in internally inter inside the uh, coalition, and they will be observing the um, the work of each member of this coalition in each country. This is our first uh, 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 th thing to say concerning that. The second thing is that we are also proposing that uh, any country at any time, when there, there is a problem of uh, uh, transparency or a problem of corruption or a problem of uh, uh, politics interfering in the work of the coalition, uh, we uh, always we will be uh, open to any uh, to uh, to any proposition, and we will always have the uh, suggestions of the uh, country members uh, uh, in order to solve any uh, upcoming problem. And thank you very much. Okay, so we move to the opposition now. 
Uh, can you please repeat the question? So the question for the opposition was the following, that uh, what are the measures, the measures that you suggest to improve the World Health Organization? Okay, uh, first of all, uh, or, or the, the, first, the first answer to this question is by setting WHO free in order to have a bold voice. How? First, uh, there are a lot, of, a lot of steps, but the most important steps first, by increasing the uh, regular budgetary funds that I have mentioned before that depend on the member dues and the organization has full control over what it wants to do with the, those funds and and at the same time to decrease the uh, the extra budgetary funds that um, uh, that that uh, that the private organization uh, donates for a specific purpose and the organization has no control over it uh, two uh, despite the political tension or despite of uh, all the tensions that who has facing uh, has faced and is facing uh, to uh, WHO has to stay uh, focused on the task at the hands and to, to continue addressing the unknown to be known by following the medical measures by facts and science because this is the only uh, this is the only uh, hope for us to follow health facts and not political uh, corruptions and uh, decisions uh, also to give the WHO authority uh, over state members unlike to the nuclear watchdog the international atomic energy agency or the world trade organization who has no redress against governments that uh, do not cooperate it has no ability to bind or sanction its members it's up it operates in countries at the pleasure and permission of the host country governments so uh, mainly it to set who free and to follow all those measure, measures and to stay connected to the medical first and health first because this is who uh, uh, message to all the world to save our health thank you thank you so i'm checking if we have we still have five minutes but like i'm checking if you have any other questions do, 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 position so i still have okay so i still have two last questions uh from the audience so the uh, the first one for the the government um it only like you quoted that it only manipulated the numbers are you implying that it's okay to manipulate numbers in an issue that had such an impact on the on the whole world and i think this is in relation to the uh, to the second rebuttal uh, of the deputy prime minister uh, for the opposition so the question is like what do you have to say about china pushing forward its agenda on globalization globalizing traditional chinese medicine which has been drafted on the 11th revision of the international classification of diseases uh, I'm, I'm not aware <laughs> this is a bit like uh, a bit a bit co a co a complicated question uh, because but like feel free if you have any information on the international classification of diseases revision uh, the 11th edition so feel free to comment otherwise it's fine so i'm just vehiculating some of the questions Is it clear? So, the leader, the leader of the opposition. Excuse me. What was the question again? What was the very last thing you said, moderator? So, it's about China pushing forward its agenda on globalizing traditional Chinese medicine, uh, which has been drafted on the eleventh. You, you know what? It's like. Never mind. Like I think this question is a bit, uh, is a bit like, it's in context, but it's like, it will be. You need to know more about the the classification of diseases in order to answer this question. So I think I will be moving forward to the last. Ah, uh, sorry. Yes. Yes, I have a message. Yes, Marwa. Maybe we don't have the info about the classification of disease or the international classification of disease, but what we have uh, to say about this point that if, if really uh, there is a Chinese medical uh, medication, why 
China uh, goes to um, to the to other uh, restricted actions in, in fighting COVID-19. China quarantines are monitored through an app. For example, everyone uh, everyone receives a unique QR code showing their status: green if you are clear to infection, and yellow if you've been instructed to to stay indoors, red if you are under quarantine. So, uh, if really they they believe in the Chinese medication as number one solution for COVID-19, then why did they close up all their uh, all the all Wuhan, for example, all, all China, and why did they take all uh, all the uh, restriction steps uh, rather than taking into consideration their uh, their push to to the to the treatment that they have? Uh, maybe this uh, this could be like uh, a yes, like a part of the of the answer that they uh, uh, that the audience has addressed to us without knowing exactly the international classification of disease. Thank you. Thank you. So no, I think now we will be moving. Um, if we have no comment from uh, from both teams, so we will be moving to the last section of this debate. Um, not the last. So the last one would be the the final po uh, poll, but like this one will be the conclusion uh, speeches for both teams. So we will have. Uh, so the floor is yours. Uh, Deputy, so the Prime Minister of, uh, of the government. The government Prime Minister, the floor is yours for the conclusion speech. And we start, timekeeper, are you ready? Thank you. Yes. Throughout this debate, we've discussed the impact of the World Health Organization on the world. Of course, there have been some back and forth, some saying that uh, the, the WHO is an essential thing, and the government side saying that the WHO is, it is high time for us to get rid of the WHO. Health is the most precious thing a person has. And its care should not be put in the hands of the incompetent and the corrupt. The World Health Organization experiment has, been, has lasted for the better part of a century and has clearly failed us all. The evidence is outstanding. It just keeps piling on and on and on and on. Isn't it time for us to call for a change? Is it in time for us to put our health above all else? The evidence is there. You simply have to open your eyes and see it. So I implore you to do so. Please open your eyes to the truth about the failing and corrupt machine that is in charge of our health and well-being. Together, we should make a better model and a better system. Together, we can bring a change that would ensure a better future for us and our loved ones. Together, we can walk a path for a better tomorrow. So won't you please take the first step with me? Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Government Prime Minister. So now we have the conclusion speech from the leader of the opposition. The floor is yours, lady. Hello again, everyone. After all the points that have been mentioned in this debate, we can obviously notice that and conclude that if we want a WHO that can respond more quickly and with more resources, we must motivate and obligate the international community to be willing to support such an, or, such an organization instead of dissolving it and depriving the world from its health, which is number one value. WHO and since 1948 is responding to many different viruses and crises effectively and this is what's shown in our arguments when we listed some of WHO real achievements. We as a position team has showed you that WHO deserves criticism but we also need to understand constraints based on it. Many of WHO weaknesses if found result from the constraints imposed by the member state and not by the WHO itself. We were clear in showing that WHO cannot be dissolved because it's accumulated so much experience for more than years in stimulating and advanced working to eradicate disease in promoting maternal and child and prevention, sorry, health and ensuring mental health and medical research and prevention of accidents and most of all, and insisting or assisting governments to, to strengthen their public health services. So setting 
so uh, setting the WHO or WH WHO free and increasing its regular budgetary funds so that the organization won't be hopelessly caught between its political technical roles is the only solution for a better and healthier world. And our priority goes to improving what we have rather than creating a new entity with zero experience. And this is what's shown in the meaningless policy that PM has mentioned in his first speech. Therefore, we are calling for better funding, flexibility and budget management and empowerment of WHO. To have a, to have bold voice. Finally, always remember our audience, dear audience, those words. Advances in global health give the world some of its brightest reasons for hope. So is our hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, both teams, for the conclusion speech. So um, thank you, dear audience. Uh, we have a distinguished guest. So thank you uh, all for. Uh, and especially Madame Louise de Souza, Her Excellency, uh, UK Ambassador, uh, who joined us. I just seen that in the in the screen. Um, so now we are in the final uh, part of this debate. So we will check how many of you changed their, their mind after uh, the excellent argumentation of one team or or the other. Uh, so I will ask uh, the organization team to. Uh, to check to display the vote uh, again so and ask you dear audience to vote again on this motion is it done by everybody Okay, perfect. So I will ask your, the organizers to check the results and then we will display uh, who was the winner of this first online debate. I hope not the last, of course. Uh, and uh, I'm really glad for being the moderator of this debate and for being part of the community. Uh, as I told you before, I'm, um, I'm a debater as well, so I enjoy watching debates and moderating debate, of course. So uh, I asked them to display the first vote and the second vote. So uh, once it's ready, it will be displayed. So this, is, this was the first vote, right? Yes. Okay, Rahma. So this, so the first vote, and then can we see the results for the second vote? Mm -hmm. So we have a pick for the opposition team. Correct me if I'm wrong. So technically, so the change, so can I see again the first poll? So for the opposition team, it was 38 and became 50, 57%. Is that true? It was 48% and it became 57. I see. And there was no, no change in the undecided people. So, so by numbers, I have to say that the winner of this debate is the opposition team. So it's like, so the uh, so congratulations to the opposition team for winning uh, this debate, and uh, congratulations again for the uh, the government team for defending uh, their motion and for defending their bill. And um, I'm, as I said before, I'm really glad to be part of uh, of such uh, energetic and dynamic group of people. And I encourage you to uh, prepare other debates, to better prepare your arguments for the next uh, debate. And, um, and uh, hopefully we will meet again in another uh, online debate by Young Mediterranean Voices. So have, have a great day, whether you are in Morocco, in uh, Algeria, in Egypt, in Tunisia, uh, and um, Ramadan Karim again. And goodbye.